Okay. Okay, we are ready to start. Uh, so welcome to the next Warsaw University Astronomical Observatory Tuesday seminar series. Uh, I cannot be seen, uh, but uh, the, the whole uh, Copernicus uh, lecture room is, is visible here. And today's um, speaker is Edita podlewska gaca from Poznań Astronomical Observatory. Mm, she um, uh, did her PhD uh, in, in Tsamkin Warsaw in, in connection with Szczecin, and now she's an adjunct in, uh, in, in Poznań. And uh, Edita is going to tell us about GLT sphere observations of asteroids. Edita, please. Okay, thank you. So maybe I will stop the video for a better connection. Uh, okay, uh, now can you see my full screen? Yes, it's fine. Uh, okay, and uh, you can't see my cursor of my mouse, uh, am I right? Yeah, we do see the cursor, yeah. Oh, that's good. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about asteroid studies on VLT sphere telescopes. A few weeks ago, Agnieszka Krzyszczyńska gave you a talk uh, describing nicely why the studies of asteroids are so important. Uh, and uh, nowadays, the increasing uh, techniques and uh, gives us a chance to, uh, to make new uh, asteroid studies. And these studies show us how few things uh, we know still about asteroids, which are relatively close uh, to our Earth. And the VLT telescope was designed to discover the great things and big events in the distant universe. But Pierre Vernaza from France had a quite crazy idea uh, to observe asteroids uh, with these uh, telescopes. So we wrote a proposal entitled uh, Asteroids, uh, Asteroids as a Tracers of Solar System Formation, Probing the Interior of Primordial Main Belt Asteroids. And the main goal of this project was to characterize the internal structure and main compositional classes of asteroids, which allow uh, to address new questions regarding the early stages of formation of planetesimals and our solar uh, system, uh, and to uh, study the collisional and dynamical evolution of asteroids. And such informations uh, can provide us constraints uh, on the Nice and Grand Tech uh, models of solar system uh, formation. So in framework of the large program uh, in this uh, project, uh, we were awarded with 152 observing hours on VLT uh, telescopes. And the project was uh, planned uh, uh, for two years from April 2017 till April 2019. But since the beginning, it brings uh, so many nice results that uh, it was extended for the next uh, half a year and we could observe asteroids till the end of September 2019. Uh, so uh, what we have done, we have uh, gathered mainly high resolution adaptive optics images of uh, large asteroids. Uh, These uh, adaptive optics images were taken on VLT uh, uh, telescopes uh, with uh, the Sphere instrument and Zimpel camera and on the uh, NACO instrument, uh, but we have used also archival data from uh, Keck telescopes. Uh, These adaptive optics images were supported by uh, ground-based dense light curves. And we have run a few observing campaigns, and we used uh, mainly the Belgian Trappist North and South uh, telescopes. Uh, we use also uh, data gathered uh, by amateur observers uh, uh, on a Gaia Gosa service, which is uh, run at our university in uh, Poznań. Uh, and we use uh, data from many other telescopes uh, all over the world, as well as uh, some archival data. Uh, and we've used also occultations uh, records, which is the 
uh, occultation timing uh, occultation timing of the stars by asteroids and the uh, uh, subject of our studies were a large main belt asteroids uh, by large we mean uh, uh, asteroids with the diameter higher than 100 kilometers we've studied only uh, we've studied only three objects for which diameter was uh, slightly lower than 100 kilometers but still they are considered as, uh, as large main belt asteroids. So everything that I'm going to tell here uh, uh, I'm, uh, is related to large asteroids and conclusions uh, that I will show you might not be true for the lower objects, which are uh, quite different than the uh, large uh, asteroids. So the main questions we have addressed in our studies are what is the di diversity in shape among large asteroids and uh, are their shapes close to the equilibrium uh, state? And uh, how uh, do the large impacts affect asteroid shape? What is the bulk density of large asteroids? And is there a relationship with their surface composition? And is there any evidence for, of differentiation among those uh, bodies? And uh, what uh, physical properties drive the formation of companion around large asteroids? So first, one of the first objects that we have studied was uh, Vesta. Vesta is a very good object uh, to start uh, the study because the Dawn mission was flying by uh, close to the asteroid uh, taking uh, very nice high resolution pictures. And here uh, the left picture shows the uh, image taken uh, at the VLT Sphere Telescope from the ground. The right uh, plot shows the pictures uh, of Vesta taken by Dawn mission. We can see that we can nicely recover not only the global shape of the asteroid, but also some surface features like the big craters on the uh, right upper uh, side, which are nicely recovered uh, on both uh, uh, pictures. Uh, similarly, the crater on the south uh, or the hill or mountain on the uh, bottom right uh, side of the pictures uh, is nicely recovered in also, uh, from the space, but also from the ground. Uh, and next picture shows uh, also Vesta from different uh, rotation phase, uh, showing uh, this, uh, this is to show how uh, much we can get from the adaptive optics uh, images. Uh, and uh, as previously, uh, the overall shape and the main surface features are nicely uh, recovered uh, from Earth uh, if we use the VLT sphere instrument. So knowing uh, how much we can get from the adaptive optics and uh, how powerful we have, uh, how powerful tool we have to our disposal, we've started to study uh, other asteroids. Uh, one of the first was 89 Julia. Uh, Julia is an uh, asteroid uh, which, uh, um, which is a parent body, which is probably parent body for a large group of uh, asteroids belonging to Julia family. So we've, uh, uh, we've pictured the uh, Julia and uh, here upper row uh, shows the uh, model uh, of this asteroid uh, at a different rotation uh, phase. Uh, red arrow shows the location of the rotation axis. And uh, this and the second row shows only the images uh, obtained with uh, the uh, sphere uh, instrument. Uh, and these images from the sphere instrument, together with light curves and occultations, 
uh, were used to construct the spin and shape model. To do this uh, spin and shape uh, model, we have used the ADAM algorithm. It, ADAM is an all data asteroid modeling uh, package, which allows to reconstruct uh, precise uh, rotation period, location of the uh, rotation axis and the uh, approximate uh, shape of the uh, body. Uh, and it allows uh, to reconstruct main shape features as uh, big craters or concavities. For comparison, we have used completely different method developed in our uh, observatory called, um, called SAGE. SAGE is a genetic algorithm, which is uh, now the only code which is able to reconstruct non-convex uh, asteroid shapes only from the light curves. Uh, but we have used not only light curves, but uh, for uh, more precise uh, modeling, we used also adaptive optics uh, images and uh, the occultation uh, events. And so we have two codes to compare uh, and check the convergence of uh, our results. And this uh, lower uh, picture uh, shows uh, the same as the second row. These are adaptive optics uh, images of uh, Julia taken at different rotation phase. We've marked a big impact crater called Nonza. Uh, this crater uh, have been found at Southern hemisphere of Julia, uh, and it has uh, about 75 kilometers in diameter. And numerical simulations have shown that uh, this uh, crater could have been formed as a result of a big impact with the body of the of size uh, about eight kilometers. And this uh, impact uh, could have been origin of observed uh, large group of objects belonging to Julia family. So these objects probably originated from Julia and were ejected from the asteroid via the big collision. And uh, probably there are also two big craters marked here uh, as A and B, but, uh, but uh, we need further observations to confirm the, with, uh, to be sure if they are uh, really Craters, not some artifacts. Uh, okay, next next asteroid, uh, Saihi, uh, was uh, connected previously to the iron meteorites, uh, which with the density uh, seven point eight gram per cubic centimeter, and Saihi uh, has a diameter uh, two hundred twenty six kilometers. And we have, uh, again, uh, take the adaptive optics images, like uh, which are shown on the upper row. The uh, bottom row shows the uh, model obtained from the Adam algorithm together with marked rotation axis. And uh, in 2018, uh, where the images were taken, we could see almost uh, um, geometry of view was, um, the asteroid was uh, located in such a way that we could look almost at the North Pole of the uh, asteroid. And we've calculated density of uh, Psyche, which seems to be uh, twice as low as we thought, is uh, almost twice lower than uh, the density for iron meteorites is 3.99. So it's uh, more similar to stony iron meteorites than to uh, iron meteorites. Uh, and uh, thanks to the fact uh, that the project was, prolong uh, was uh, prolonged and we could observe Psyche in the next opposition. And in the next opposition, geometry was so favorable that we could look at the equatorial uh, parts of the 
uh, of this asteroid. And we have found that uh, this asteroid is more flattened than we previously thought. And the extent along the Z axis uh, is lower than it was estimated before. Thus, the volume is lower. So the final density uh, that we have found is 4.2 gram per cubic centimeter, which perfectly match the stony iron meteorites. And this is uh, the object with the highest density among large main belt objects. And uh, the precise calculation of this density was possible thanks to the uh, prolongation of the project and thanks to the favor favorable geometry of uh, view and precise uh, volume determination. Next asteroid, Daphne, uh, seems to be a very low density asteroid. In this case, the density is 1.76 gram per cubic centimeter. Uh, and uh, Daphne is uh, the belongs to CH and CGH spectral type asteroids. And this low density means that such asteroids belong to a group of undifferentiated bodies with probably homogeneous internal structure. And we have uh, imaged uh, also the small satellite of Daphne, which is moving on equatorial quasi-circular prograde orbit. And this small satellite is marked uh, by the small circle. Uh, if you see my cursor, I'm showing the circle uh, it, uh, yeah, with the location of this small asteroid here. And thanks to the presence of this, presence of this small uh, asteroid, we were able to precisely estimate mass of the Daphne and it finally its uh, density. But the biggest surprise, in my opinion, from the whole project brings us the asteroid Hygieia. Uh, Hygieia is the fourth biggest uh, asteroid uh, in the main belt. And although it is uh, very big and bright, uh, we uh, knew very few about this object. Uh, before the start of this uh, project, uh, we knew the rotation period, which uh, supposed to be 27 hours, uh, 27 hours, yeah. Uh, and the light curve displayed a very nice ellipsoidal shape with two maxima and uh, two minima. Uh, and uh, this is a great example how our minds are affected by triaxial ellipsoid and how uh, we have deep in mind that asteroids should look like ellipsoids. Uh, after uh, this uh, project, in this project, we have found that these two uh, maxima, in fact, not two maxima, but this is one maximum observed twice. Uh, so the true rotation period is not 27 hours, but uh, something like uh, 13 and a half hour. And this uh, peculiar shape with one uh, big maximum of, uh, on Hygieia is caused uh, by the albedo variation uh, on its uh, surface. And uh, it was found that uh, Hygieia is almost perfectly round. Uh, uh, Hygieia is the parent body of a uh, large uh, family of Hygieia asteroids. This group of asteroids consists a few thousands of objects which probably originated for, uh, uh, from Hygieia. So we were expecting to find the big impact crater as it was found on Julia asteroid. But we have imaged the Hygieia uh, very precisely and we have found no signs of any cratering. Moreover, Hygieia is very spherical object. Uh, it's uh, more spherical than Vesta and Pallas. 
Uh, and it's uh, so spherical that it's probably in hydrostatic equilibrium, which means that it fulfill all necessary conditions to be considered as a dwarf planet rather than the asteroid. And here I uh, plot the mean radius versus asphericity, and the red arrow shows the location of uh, Hygieia. Uh, uh, and, it's, uh, and it lies in the region where we expect uh, dwarf uh, planets. So if we have perfectly round Hygieia and large group of asteroids belonging to Hygieia family, so there is a question how this family could have been formed. And uh, SPH simulations can answer to this uh, question. Uh, we have shown that uh, uh, Hygieia could have been heated by a large uh, body with the diameter uh, 100 kilometers or higher. And here are examples of uh, the uh, results of the simulation of collision of Hygieia with uh, objects with the uh, size of 150, 100, on, and 120 kilometers. And it was found that Hygieia, after, during the collision, was totally disrupted. And then uh, most of the species reaccumulated again reaching the final equilibrium state, as you can see on the uh, right uh, hand side. And the leftovers, which remained after these collisions, were ejected and formed the large group of uh, uh, objects belonging to the Hygieia family. So this is one possible scenario of creating asteroid families. Uh, they can be created uh, via a big impact, which completely destroys the asteroid, uh, and most uh, of the material reaccumulate again, uh, reaching the uh, very spherical shape. Uh, another asteroid, uh, Interamnia, is also very spherical. Interamnia is the fifth larger, uh, largest asteroid. Uh, similarly to Hygieia, it's very spherical, but uh, we can see some signs of cratering. Uh, here uh, I marked with the uh, red circle, uh, big crater on the surface. And uh, on the surface of Hygieia, we could identify also some spike or hill marked here with the blue uh, arrow. And uh, we have found the, we have estimated the precise uh, diameter of the Hygieia to be 332 kilometers and its uh, density. Uh, and uh, knowing that Interamnia is very spherical body on this uh, plot, uh, mean radius versus asphericity would be somewhere here between Hygieia and uh, Pallas and Vesta, which are not so spherical, although they are bigger than Interamnia. Uh, so we can conclude that if we want to look for a uh, less spherical body, we should go uh, to the objects with diameters below 100. Uh, kilometers. So next object uh, that we have uh, studied is Iris. In contrary to very spherical interamnia in, and into almost perfectly spherical uh, Hygieia, Iris is heavily cratered. Uh, here the upper uh, row shows the model of the iris with marked uh, uh, rotation axis. The lower panels, uh, lower row, uh, shows the adaptive uh, optics uh, uh, images. And we have estimated the diameter of uh, 2, uh, 215 kilometers and the density, uh, which is uh, quite high. 
And the overall shape of the iris is, uh, can be described as an oblate ellipsoid with large equatorial excavation. Uh, here uh, at the bottom, uh, we've got the circle uh, and, uh, and uh, the view from the north and uh, south pole of the iris. And we can see big uh, lack of material at uh, equatorial, at uh, the equa equator. Uh, so this might be a sign that uh, we could expect uh, also a big group of the iris family. But such group of iris uh, family, uh, asteroids in iris family have not be been found. So iris don't have uh, the, its uh, dynamical uh, family. So uh, we proposed that uh, this uh, lack of uh, this equatorial excavation, this lack of uh, uh, the material here, was probably caused by big impact. But the impact was uh, so long time ago, longer than three giga years. So the ejected object cannot be dynamically connected to with uh, this uh, parent body anymore. And next object, uh, looking like a golf ball, is a palace. Here you can see the pictures from the southern and northern hemisphere of the palace. And what we can see is uh, the large amount of craters on its surface. We have identified 36 craters larger than uh, 30 kilometers in diameter and uh, a lot of smaller uh, craters and such uh, heavy, heavily cratered uh, surface could have been formed uh, because of peculiar orbit of Pallas. Pallas is orbiting on a, a high inclined uh, nation and uh, it has high eccentricity, which causes that the impact velocity is much higher than for other asteroids in the solar, in the main belt. Uh, the calculated mean impact velocity on Pallas uh, is uh, 11 uh, kilometer per second. While for other uh, asteroids, it's around five kilometers per uh, second. So this means that even uh, that uh, hitting by smaller object can uh, result in bigger craters. Uh, moreover, it has, uh, if you uh, see carefully this uh, at this uh, left uh, picture, on the left side, uh, there is a, some bright spot and there is a hypothesis that is a large salt deposit on the Pallas and the near earth object uh, called Peton uh, is uh, probably, probably dynamically connected with Pallas. Uh, it comes from the Pallas uh, family and uh, Peton is a source for a Geminite uh, meteor stream, uh, which is characterized by diversity of sodium. So there is a hypothesis that this diversity of sodium uh, comes from the fact that uh, we've got a large deposit of the salt on Pallas. Uh, but this is just the hypothesis which needs to be proved and studied in further uh, detail. Another very strange looking asteroid uh, is a Cleopatra called uh, in the press as a dog bone. Uh, here upper uh, row uh, shows the images of uh, the Cleopatra taken uh, by uh, sphere instrument and uh, uh, low, uh, the bottom row shows the model of Cleopatra with marked rotation axis. And uh, the Cleopatra uh, has uh, have two lobes connected with thick neck. And uh, previously no density for Cleopatra was five gram per cubic centimeter, 
which is extremely high and uh, means that uh, Cleopatra is, uh, should be metal rich uh, with uh, very low porosity, which is inconsistent with such peculiar uh, shape. But our studies have shown that in fact, mass of Cleopatra is 56% lower than previously thought. So the density, uh, lower mass means also lower density. And uh, the new calculated density is 3.38 gram per cubic centimeter, which suggests that Cleopatra is metal rich body, but with substantial porosity. Uh, it might be even a rubble uh, pile of the uh, material. And we have calculated the local gravitational acceleration at the surface of Cleopatra. Here, the left uh, panel shows the view from the uh, north uh, pool, and the right one shows uh, the view along the equator. We can see that higher gravitational acceleration is uh, in the lobes, which means higher mass concentration. And uh, at the edges and at the, in the neck, the uh, acceleration is very weak. And uh, Cleopatra uh, is in fact a triple system. It has two satellites. Uh, uh, if we uh, next look at the equipotential uh, surfaces, uh, we can see that Cleopatra fulfills almost all the equipotential uh, surface, and it's in and it is uh, in the critically rotating state. So, taking into account its probably very porous structure with uh, low uh, acceleration at the edges, we can conclude that the two moons uh, were formed via mass shedding from the uh, surface of the main uh, body. And another asteroid, Sylvia, <clears throat> is a P-type asteroid. And the P and D spectral type of asteroids are thought to be formed uh, in outer solar system beyond the orbit of, of uh, Neptune. And they were implanted into main belt during the giant planet migration. And uh, we have, uh, again, as always, uh, the sphere images uh, of this asteroid in the upper low, the model with marked rotation axis uh, in the bottom row. And the shape of Sylvia appears to be a flat and elongate. And Sylvia also belongs to the triple system. It has two small satellites. And this uh, flat uh, shape of the Sylvia should imply that we should detect nodal precession of the satellite. And the detail analysis shows that the motion of satellites is fully Keplerian. So this suggests uh, inhomogeneous internal structure. And uh, Sylvia, uh, probably the best fitting uh, model, uh, which, is, which agree with uh, the uh, observations of satellite's motion, uh, shows that Sylvia possess the inner uh, porous uh, core uh, filled with percolated water and then outer layer of ice-free porous rock and primordial, uh, very primordial outer uh, layer. Uh, and this suggests that uh, it passed through a partial melting and reaccumulation during its uh, evolution. So uh, concluding, uh, uh, we have studied uh, totally 42 large, large main belt asteroid, 39 were have uh, sizes larger than 100 kilometers, and three of them have sizes a bit smaller uh, than 100 kilometers. 
And we have studied 20 out of 23 known asteroids with a diameter higher than 20 kilometers. Such a big sample uh, can um, be used to construct some general results. And we have found that there are two, maybe not families, but uh, groups of objects uh, as a function of the diameters. Big objects are very round and smaller large mingle asteroids have more elongated and flattened shapes. Difference, uh, this bimodality can be related to difference in a rotation period. The uh, shorter rotation, uh, the object with shorter rotation period, uh, shorter than, by shorter, I mean shorter than uh, six hours, it shows uh, usually elongated shape. Uh, and the uh, objects that rotate slower than six hours, uh, usually even slower than 10 hours, shows more spherical shapes. Uh, primaries in multiple systems are, are usually elongated and possess short uh, rotation period. This may indicate uh, a very intensive uh, collisional history. Uh, and uh, if we have uh, huge collisions, but the, the really huge, uh, these huge collisions uh, can cause total disruption of the asteroid and final reaccumulation. And large, but not very huge collisions uh, are origin of basins and uh, large craters. And these are two ways, the total disruption of the asteroid and the reaccumulations, as well as the uh, mm, collisions uh, leaving the uh, large craters and basins. These are two ways of creation of uh, asteroid uh, families. And finally, uh, I have gathered here and uh, the uh, images uh, show which shows uh, uh, which show uh, all investigated objects. Uh, here you can see how different shape do they have and how different in size uh, they are from the biggest uh, Ceres to the uh, lowest studies uh, with VLT uh, asteroid uh, Urania. And uh, at the very, very end, uh, as, a summar as, as a summary, uh, this uh, project was, I think, very successful. It resulted in two papers published in Nature Astronomy and 13 papers, uh, 12 in uh, Astronomy and Astrophysics, one in Amenaras. And there were at least uh, three SO press releases. Uh, and uh, there are still a lot of data that needs to be processed so we can expect uh, next uh, papers. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, maybe I'll thank switch on. Very impressive work. Um, so I see there is a question from Paweł Zielinski on Zoom. Paweł, go ahead and ask this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? Hello? Yes. Hey, oh, hello, very nice talk. Uh, it's quite impressive uh, for me because these targets are um, known from years, right? And uh, I, I, I assume that we know everything about these uh, asteroids, uh, but it's not true. Uh, so uh, it's really, really nice, uh, nice work. I have a question about uh, um, the polarimetric observations of asteroids, because as far as I know, uh, thanks to the polarimetry, we can determine uh, some additional parameters, for example, albedo. Uh, do you use some polarimetric data in your, in your analysis or you, you focus only on imaging? Uh, well, we have focused here only on imaging, 
But in our observatory, the people uh, work with Irina Belskaya, who is an expert in uh, polarimetry. And uh, we construct the phase curves, which is the, an alternative method to polarimetry or the complementary method. Uh, to uh, describe the albedo and other surface features uh, like the porosity uh, and uh, other uh, things. But in this project, uh, we didn't use the polarimetry. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Very nice work. Thanks. Thank you. Next question, Radek. Hi, it's Radek speaking. Hi. So, uh, I would like to ask you uh, about the densities of the asteroids. What's the range from like lowest densities to the highest? That's first question. And the second is, what's the future of Cleopatra? Is it going to break into two separate asteroids? And if so, on what time scale? Uh, well, uh, according to the density, the most dense object that we have found is point 4.2 gram per cubic centimeter. The lowest is just above one uh, gram per cubic centimeter. But uh, this range depends uh, not only on the chemical compositions, but also on the structure. We have uh, asteroids which are solid bodies and we have asteroids which are the rubble piles uh, uh, with uh, substantial voids inside and high porosity. So the density of asteroids, it's, uh, it's a very important parameter, but it's, uh, they say it's very hard to estimate, especially that we don't have uh, good mass uh, determination for a really large group of asteroids. In fact, uh, precise mass estimation we can have only for asteroids which have uh, companions, moons. Uh, otherwise, the mass estimate is burdened with very high uncertainty. So, so the density of asteroids is, a, is an open question. Uh, and uh, if it's going about Cleopatra, uh, in fact, uh, we don't know. <laughs> what can happen. It's in a critically rotating state, which means that some material can escape from the surface. But I don't think uh, it will break into two parts. Uh, if I think the forces inside uh, the body uh, are, uh, in fact, uh, so strong that uh, it will be kept uh, in one piece, at least for sometime. Okay, thank you. Any other questions here in the room or on the Zoom? Questions? I, I have one. Uh, how much time you, you spent on one target? Because you've had 150 hours, that's quite a lot, mm -hmm. but spread over some time, right? So, but, and you've observed like dozens of those. So how much time you spent on uh, one target? Uh, it, de it depends on the object. If the object was perfectly round, uh, like Hygieia, it was enough to observe it along, it, uh, along its one uh, rotation, 13 hours. If we had objects which rotate uh, faster, like uh, let's say five hours, it's enough to observe for five hours, uh, maybe not for five hours, but uh, Mm, but taking picture at different rotation phase to uh, cover the whole uh, surface. So it depends on the asteroid rotation, but it also depend on, depend on the first results. Like for example, for uh, Saihi, we observe it uh, uh, during one apparition and we thought uh, it's enough. Uh, but uh, the density was incompatible we, with that, what we have expect. So we decided to observe it in uh, another opposition. And it was found that, in fact, we were right to observe it because we have found that it's uh, more flattened than we previously thought. And uh, now the 
the density, the new calculation of density show that is in perfect agreement of what we have expect. So it depends on the rotation period uh, that uh, that we wanted to cover the whole surface, and it depends on the first result. Uh, and uh, we've decided if this object is interesting enough to. Uh, to dedicate more observing time or we go to another object. So, so it was, uh, the time was varied from object to object. Okay, and uh, kind of follow-up question because you've used ESO and I'm trying to encourage everyone uh, to use ESO as much as, as much as possible. So how difficult it was uh, first to get the time and then also to process the data, because this is quite challenging data set, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, huh. Well, Pierre had a good experience with writing proposals, so our proposal was successful. And we have people which are in our group, which are experts in data analysis. So they have used this uh, dedicated Mistral algorithm to get such nice pictures. And uh, we have got other people who uh, did the spin and shape modeling and other from thermophysical modeling and people from numerical simulations. So uh, many people um, experienced in different kinds of uh, topics were involved uh, in the uh, whole uh, process. So I think that is uh, one of the reasons why this project was so successful. Yeah, I see. So uh, very good teamwork. Uh, well distributed tasks and uh, yeah so that's the way to go yeah. okay thank you very much Edita we don't have any more questions here so thank you for this talk we'll do the clapping again thank you thank you and goodbye thank you bye